Joining me now is best-selling author of The Madness of Crowds and The Strange Death of Europe, as well as associate editor of The Spectator, Douglas Murray. Douglas, let's start with today's New York Post front page. Joe Bryben, the FBI has a secret file alleging then Veep Biden took money from foreign nationals. Of course, those of us who've been paying attention to the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop are not too shocked by these uh, news reports. No, that's right, Rita. I mean, the extraordinary thing is, of course, is that you say those of us who've been paying attention. Unfortunately, a lot of the media have not been paying attention. Uh, it's it's three years now since the New York Post broke the Hunter Biden laptop uh, story. It's three years since most of the media in America and most of the rest of the world shut the story down. It's three years since Twitter and Facebook and others suspended the account of the New York Post. And so uh, a lot of people, if they got anything of this story, only got the you know, salacious side of it, let's say. But that was never the story. And you and I have discussed this before. The story was never really the, uh, you know, the, the sex and the drugs and things. The story was whether or not the first, what is now the first family in America is, is purchasable. And that by any standards in any era other than our own would be the story of the day. And it's only because we live in this strange world where you can sort of people pursue whatever, you know, fits their own agenda, that people are just catching up with this. But I think that's to the detriment, not just of America and the media, but of, uh, of all of the democracies and the ability of the free media to actually chase down what are real stories. Now... We're only 24 hours away from the coronation, um, but the activist class have got in nice and early. They're demanding King Charles meet a list of demands. And, of course, the Australian left have joined in this. Uh, the Guardian reports Australians have joined Indigenous leaders and politicians across the Commonwealth to demand King Charles III make a formal apology for the effects of British colonisation and make reparations by redistributing the wealth of the British Crown. Douglas, your response? I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, Rita? Uh, uh, first of all, how many apologies would, uh, would these people in question like? And how much cash do they want? And, 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 and to which account do they want it to be wired? I mean, it, it's so preposterous. I, I get the strong feeling that a lot of the people who are doing this activism are, as I've suggested to you before, either just rattling a tin cup and hoping that somebody will, uh, will, will, will put some cash in it, or actually wildly historically ignorant, very ignorant people, and shakedown merchants. That's all we're dealing with at this point. And, um, you know, uh, it would be interesting It would be interesting to get into the granular detail. They always want the granular detail to be suggested, uh, uh, provided by the people they're criticising. Let's get into the granular detail of what these people are actually suggesting. You know, as I say, whose bank account do they want the money to be paid into? Um, uh, uh, how many times do people have to apologise? Um, how many generations, by the way, does inherited guilt last for? I mean, let's pretend that the British monarchy has anything to do with current Aboriginal issues in Australia. Let's pretend for a moment it does. Um, how many generations does that involve? Uh, can we do it the other way around? Mm -hmm. Does any Aboriginal who's ever done anything wrong have to account for generations for things? I... I it, it's such a preposterous thing at this stage. There's a very funny piece I'd urge people to read at The Spectator at the moment. It's online by somebody writing slightly tongue-in-cheek, perhaps not, uh, uh, called Sean Thomas, saying, um, tracing his own family lineage in the UK back and saying, uh, what might I be owed? Uh, he's worked out that most mm -hmm. of his forebears in the 19th century worked down tin mines, and they worked down those mines at the age of 10, uh, 10 onwards, wow. and the average life expectancy was 23. Well, mm. who owes who what for that? 
That was an average person in Britain. That was an average person in Britain. I, I think a lot of us have had enough of the whining and the moaning of people who really have never suffered anything themselves other than self-inflicted wounds. Well, it is really appropriating the suffering of your ancestors, uh, and that should not be something that is uh, celebrated. But in yeah. modern Australia and in the West in general, it is, unfortunately. Yes. And also in this country right now, we're having a uh, big push from some quarters to legalise or at least decriminalise illicit drugs. We're introducing more and more pill testing, looking to open up more drug injecting facilities. But at the same time, the government is increasing the already steep taxes on tobacco. You've written about this same trend happening in America. And I think in a number of US cities, they're well down this road where uh, yes. I remember being in New York City. You can't walk anywhere without being assaulted with a stench of marijuana. Yes. That's absolutely right, Rita. I had some friends from London visiting in New York recently. They had four children, all under the age of 10. And the, it was striking that even a family from London walking through New York, the children suddenly noticed, what is that smell everywhere? And one of them, one of the children actually said out loud, uh, one of the other five-year-olds said, what is that smell? I said, it's the smell of failure. Um, <laughs> which maybe um, his mother mouthed thank you at me. Uh, but it was striking to me that people notice, yeah, in New York, that the, the air is just filled with marijuana. Uh, I don't really care what people do with their own private lives. I don't really care what they, you know, they, where they find their pleasures. I do mind when people pretend that the decriminalization of drugs doesn't involve a whole set of other problems. You know, in, in city after city in America, where drugs have been legalized that were previously illegal, uh, you do not see an uptick in the average, you know, well-being of the population. Uh, the mm. former governor of New York said that when marijuana was legalized in New York, we would all be able to sort of benefit from this great uptick of, of, in, of happiness and money, apparently, in taxation we were meant to gain from. None of that happened. We see a lot of very doped out people on the streets. We see a lot of hopeless cases. A lot of middle class people who sort of have a bit of fun every now and then and don't think it has any knock on effects for, for them or other people. And I think they're wrong on that. Um, but the bit, most bizarre one of all is, is, is this thing of simultaneously legalizing marijuana and other drugs whilst trying to decriminalize tobacco. And I'm, I'm, I'm not pro tobacco wildly, but what, what are the rules here exactly? You know, if you're worried about the health and well-being of the population, you why have simultaneously a war on tobacco and a war for marijuana? It makes no sense to me. Mm. And I wish that people were able to just actually analyze what has been claimed would happen from decriminalization and what has actually happened. And not only have you not seen the riches come in from this new industry, but you also haven't seen a reduction in crime. That was something else that was no. promised by the advocates, that if you legalise, then criminality would plummet. Well, it hasn't in New right. York, certainly. Shocker. Now, finally, I want to ask you about a... <laughs> Shocker, indeed. Uh, you wrote a fantastic piece recently, and given it was uh, Israel recently celebrating its 75 years of statehood, yes. I wanted to ask you about the pathology of anti-Semitism and, and what the modern left doesn't really understand about that hatred. Yes, well, I, I wrote about this uh, in The Spectator because... There has been another um, case of sort of extraordinary left-wing anti-Semitism. The Guardian newspaper in uh, in England that mm. regards itself as being the bastion and defender of liberal values, it, which has accused everything of being racist in recent years. The Guardian has accused um, gardening of being racist, and yeah. the Guardian <laughs> has also accused the English countryside of being racist. It's basically, it's also said that town planning is racist, and I think roads are racist as well, Rita. Uh, of course. But the point is, is, of course. is that in the midst of all of that, 
they published a profoundly anti-Semitic cartoon again last weekend. And I simply pointed out, you know, I think that that old adage, which you and I know, that people are very often the thing that they, that they accuse you of, actually is the case here again with The Guardian. The mm. Guardian loves to point the finger. It loves to claim that everyone else is racist. But a cartoonist draws a very, very anti-Semitic caricature of a Jewish man, as they did last weekend. It just flows past the editorial desk. Nobody notices until everyone else notices. And then they realize, Oh, we've marked up. Ooh. Well, yes, you have. And people mind because you go around accusing everyone else of being racist and you seem to be quite racist yourselves. I simply think it should be another reminder of the fact that the modern left, the Guardian, these sorts of people, they want to be the deciders of what is and is not permissible in the town square. They do not have that right because they have not earned it. They don't have the right to excommunicate or anything else. Uh, um, the people who preach the most in this situation are very often guilty the most. So I wish that this was a learning moment for The Guardian, but if The Guardian was capable of learning moments, uh, it might have noticed that since its own foundational uh, money was in slavery, it probably doesn't have a right to exist itself and might have closed itself down. But, you know, we can only wish, Rita. We could live in hope. But, yeah, I don't think they're going to learn from this because they are repeat offenders and there is a lot of projection there. And uh, at least yes. they've taken down this particularly anti-Semitic cartoon. They've still got the one of Pretty Patel up. And to me, yes. that's a wildly um, racist cartoon. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, so th and that was only a couple of years ago. So they don't seem to learn from their many mistakes. Douglas Murray? They do not. Always a pleasure. Thank you for joining me tonight. Great pleasure. Thank you.